Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the symposium, I communicate with Martha Minna, uh, uh, who is at Harvard one of the leading scholars on the TRC. And she recommended uh, Jens uh, Mayer Henrik uh, as a fine speaker and scholar referring to his 2008 book, The Legacies of Law, published in Cambridge. Uh, uh, and uh, just to give you an excerpt, uh, not from uh, Jens's book, but from a an article that he wrote on a systematized concept uh, of reconciliation, uh, I'll share the following. Jens writes, improved conceptual awareness is essential for understanding the causes and consequences as well as the courses of reconciliation. At best, the current methodological practice sows conceptual confusion. At worst, it creates conceptual misunderstandings that call into question research findings as well as practical achievements in pursuit of justice in times of transition. Concept formation is concerned with the most basic question of social science research. What are we talking about? Answers to this question are indispensable for moving from concept formation to proposition formation to research design in the methodology of the social sciences. These interdependent tasks form the foundation for explanation and understanding. For as a protagonist of the old conceptualism put it, as we are prisoners of the words we pick, we had better pick them well. The principal objective of this article is to help scholars of dispute resolution pick their concepts of reconciliation well. It is to encourage scholarship that reflects deliberately on the meaning of words, scholarship that takes seriously the connection between ideas and facts. Yes? Thank you, Professor Sharp, for your kind introduction, and I'm very grateful to be here today. Um, my talk is concerned with the measurement of reconciliation, and I think no one in this room needs convincing that reconciliation is ultimately a desirable process or outcome, depending on how we define it. And yet I venture that few of us would have a compelling answer to the question, how do we know it, reconciliation, when we see it? Mine is an attempt to help us to see the centrality of the question for affecting real-world outcomes. In this sense, my talk integrates insights from both theory and practice, and thus might make for a nice transition between panels one this morning and the panel two that is following. My talk deals with the promise and limits of reconciliation in the wake of what some of you might consider unforgivable acts and omissions, namely international crimes. And we had a few people uh, invoke a number of these crimes against the Holocaust and genocide more generally, um, these are the issues that I'm grappling with. And I'm concerned with reconciliation in the aftermath of these kinds of um, events. But before I commence with the analysis proper, let me explain how I became involved in the study of reconciliation and why I care about measurement. As you might have um, gathered by my accent, um, I'm German. Um, so the Preoccupation with reconciliation and international crimes is both personal and professional for me. I also, as Professor Sharp mentioned, um, published a book on South Africa uh, recently that uh, was concerned with the role of legal norms and legal institutions in the transition to and from apartheid. And what I ultimately argued in that book was that counterintuitively, um, apartheid may have been necessary for making democracy work, by which I meant that the um, long-standing legal tradition that also undergirded apartheid uh, provided an essential modicum of stability and of certainty during the transition, which thus made it possible to establish democracy more effectively 
uh, and less violently. violently. Um, I lived in South Africa for the better part of two years, uh, starting in 1995 and 96, and also in 97, and as such learned a fair amount about the country and its people. Um, Johannesburg in particular held my attention. There I met Paul Van Sale, uh, who was then at the center for the study of violence and reconciliation, so I'm coming full circle here. Um, Paul Van Sale would go on to become the executive director of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, with which I will be concerned today, and is now with the International Center for Transitional Justice in New York. It was Paul who, in 1995, involved me not only in the center's work in the TRC, and I should mention, when I came to the center, there was no such thing as a TRC. So I attended many workshops, many conferences, very much like this, where very stakeholders and um, former adversaries talked about the uh, possible forms and functions of a truth commission, because all that was agreed upon in the uh, so-called sunset clause was that amnesty had to be granted to perpetrators. Now, it was one former minister of justice who insisted that this should be a victim-centered process, and thus came about the idea of a truth commission, which, as you probably know, um, hinged on the idea that amnesty would only be granted to those who confessed their wrongs committed during apartheid, and only a full disclosure would entitle them to amnesty. Um, so all of this had not yet been created when I joined the center, and I was, I was fortunate enough, I only realized in retrospect how fortunate um, that I was able to, to, to gain a glimpse uh, as a budding lawyer uh, as to what would uh, await the world. Now, so I wasn't just involved in the TRC uh, research and, and, and practice, um, uh, which, as I mentioned, hadn't been heralded or transplanted the world over, but I was also um, allowed to work together with two other staff uh, an extended, for an extended period of time in Alexandra, um, then one of the most densely populated and most violently contested townships in South Africa, located on the northern fringe of Johannesburg. So primarily what you will hear today from me is based on, um, I don't want to say first-hand experience, because I... Um, was luckily not uh, ever a victim of violence, but I've seen uh, conditions in which people are forced to uh, coexist after violence has transpired. So many of these experiences, whether in Cambodia, uh, in Rwanda, in Argentina, uh, or, or South Africa, have informed my thinking about concepts, about ideas and facts as well. Um, so it was Alexandra that I acquired a feel for the convoluted politics of South Africa and notably for the real and imagined cleavages that had driven it apart. In May 1995, the National Peace Accord Trust had commissioned the center uh, where I was employed to facilitate change in Alexandra. The project's aim was to empower about 1,200 families, including their violent members and other so-called stakeholders from different constituencies who had been displaced as a result of collective violence that had torn to shred the social fabric of Alexandra in 1992. Ultimately, this demanded that the center and our three-person crew who acted on its behalf play a central role in attempting to rebuild shattered relationships, facilitate the process of sustainable local-level reconstruction and development, and set in motion a process of reconciliation. I'm using um, the inverted commas in order to draw attention to the slogans that have been floating around uh, much of the field of, of reconciliation studies and so on, because they often become meaningless the more often we use them. They're all uh, associated with some inherent value and goal, and yet I think we often don't step, uh, step back and, and ask ourselves um, what their meaning really um, contains. And this sort of echoes some of the remarks made uh, during the first panel as well. So I'm not sure what, if any, our contribution was in Alexandra, but I remain truly grateful for the township's hostel dwellers and inhabitants, and one of the areas in which I work was called the Beirut area, uh, in reference to Lebanon and sort of the turmoil, upheaval, destruction um, that people remembered from the early 80s there. So you get an idea of, um, of what this township looked like and what kind of um, issues the inhabitants faced. So this is... Um, by way of, of a background to my research into the causes and causes of violence and ultimately also responses to such violence. So it was then that I first began to ruminate the, the problem of reconciliation's measurement, even though I didn't quite know then that that's what I was engaged in. Um, then came Rwanda. Um, I have been working on Rwanda for the last um, seven years, and I'm about to finish a book um, on legal responses to the Rwandan genocide. Uh, and I have... Um, 
been focusing in particular on ordinary trials in Rwanda, but also on the uh, formation, deformation, transformation of so-called gachacha jurisdictions. Gachacha um, is Kinyarwanda for justice on the grass, and this is an ostensibly, uh, or it's a, re it's a reliance on an ostensibly traditional method of dispute uh, resolution in South Africa that was revamped uh, in the aftermath of the genocide, uh, supposedly in order to deal with the large backlog of cases. And to give you one idea, uh, still in 2002, when I first went there, when these uh, jurisdictions got underway, still 110 or so thousand um, suspected genocidaires were uh, languishing in the country's prisons uh, in really um, uh, abhorrent um, conditions. So Rwanda, and we are celebrating, of course, um, this spring, the 15th anniversary um, of the genocide, um, was another case that informed, I think, about reconciliation because there was such a need for people to get along uh, and yet again, as in Alexandra, uh, to prevent them from re-engaging uh, uh, in violence. Um, now, I'm also talking about measurement and, and concepts because I feel there's a great deal of naivete surrounding these issues, both uh, regarding South Africa and Rwanda. And this is particularly pronounced uh, in the Western world and here in the U.S. as well, where people have a very hard time to come to terms with the complexity of violence. We talked about um, the issue of perpetrators and victims, and these issues are never really that clear in either context, and particularly so in Rwanda, where um, to just invoke the title of one book on the conflict, victims became killers, and the, the boundaries of responsibility, of guilt, of blameworthiness are, are very, very blurred. Um, so now, um, my entire talk and my entire work is, uh, is intended to basically diminish certainty on your part and, and anybody who, who is um, um, nice enough to read what I have to say, um, to really have us rethink some of these, these knee-jerk responses we have to uh, what Carlos Nino called radical evil. Okay, so what are they all shouting about? Reconciliation. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, or TRC for short, has been heralded the world over. Um, the 21st so-called Truth Commission ever to be created, it was the first to find imitators. Um, the TSC's work in many respects inaugurated the international preoccupation with reconciliation as a response to historical injustice, whether in Afghanistan or Iraq, or Rwanda or Sudan. It has been built by many as a harbinger of justice in times of transitions. Let us briefly consider the TSC's performance. Um, Established by way of law in 1995, the TSC was a multi-purpose exercise. Um, the outgrowth of a political compromise, and this is often forgotten, it was charged with, one, discovering the truth about apartheid, granting amnesty to those who um, were deemed perpetrators, and thirdly, fostering individual and national reconciliation. The TSC investigated so-called gross human rights violations committed on, on the territory um, of South Africa, not so much in the region, between 1960 and May 1994. To this end, it collected 22,000 testimonies um, of victims and survivors and held a score of public hearings around the country. And I talked with one of our audience members earlier who was lucky enough to attend some of these sessions as well, and I would be grateful for any additional insights you have to offer during the question and answer period. Um, so I was there during these, these goings on. Um, so what did the TRC do? Uh, as I mentioned already in the beginning, it foregrounded the interests of victims. And this was a major accomplishment um, that we have to credit to, to this institution. Uh, it was also a remarkable achievement in the sense that it was instrumental in closing many individual dossiers, if you like, uh, on the path, revealing what happened to sons, fathers, brothers, sisters, mothers, and daughters, um, and laid to rest many of the uncertainty that surrounded the disappearance or death of their loved ones. In other words, it provided, um, to some at least, a modicum of catharsis. Of course, it didn't do this to many others, and that's, of course, where the controversy surrounding the institution um, began. Um, in addition, the TRC produced a much-criticized report, uh, published in five volumes and spanning more than 2,700 pages of text. This report has been faulted for ignoring substantial evidence archival and otherwise, and for failing to account for the complexities of apartheid. The resulting narrative has been described as brief, selective, and at times historically inaccurate. This notwithstanding, one observer, uh, James Gibson, who is a political scientist at Washington University in St. Louis, concludes that the TRC's tenure was, quote, phenomenally successful, 
Um, others disagree, some wholeheartedly. Richard Wilson, a British anthropologist, insists that the TRC's excessive moralism, in addition to what he termed excessive legalism, uh, made impossible any movement toward reconciliation in South Africa. And let me just quote from him directly, writes Wilson. Turning human rights talk into a moral theoretical treatise which extols forgiveness and reconciliation in an effort to forgo a new moral vision for the nation in the end destroys the most important promise of human rights. That is, its possible contribution to a thoroughgoing transformation of an authoritarian criminal justice system and the construction of real and lasting democratic legitimacy. A middle position is occupied by Deborah Posel, a, a sociologist at WITS, the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Um, she shares with Wilson a dissatisfaction um, over the work of the TRC and is particularly uh, animated uh, with regard to the report that I already mentioned before. And she claims that the report distorts rather than clarifies the machination, machinations of apartheid. And in other words, it failed in bringing about historical truth. And the idea of truth was mentioned in passing earlier, and I think we can discuss this later on as well. What, if any, contribution does truth make, and what kind of truth really makes what kind of contribution, right? Since it's the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Okay, so who are we to believe? Um, did truth lead to reconciliation in South Africa? Um, can truth lead to reconciliation elsewhere in other settings? Um, I maintain that in order to be able to answer this question, we need to take uh, more seriously than we have the question of reconciliation's measurement. Um, thus far, virtually all accounts of reconciliation's rise or decline are based on anecdotal or episodic evidence. What then is to be done? Um, I suggest that scholars of reconciliation, um, to the extent that they are serious about the real world, um, acquaint themselves with the methodology of the social sciences. Now, in recent years, scholars from neighboring disciplines have emphasized the importance of conceptual rigor in designing, administering, and interpreting research in the social sciences. What I've called this new conceptualism uh, has addressed problems of conceptualization and measurement, examined issues of ontology and validity, and investigated the strengths and weaknesses of causal inference in both qualitative and quantitative research. It has analyzed in an unprecedented depth uh, methodological obstacles to sound scholarship and reviewed possible solutions to these obstacles. Now, drawing on the new conceptualism, because, you know, if you've read Weber or Marx, dealing with concepts is really nothing new, um, but drawing on this newer version, this more sophisticated, more rigorous version of conceptualism, um, I will in the remainder reflect on the much-talked-about notion of reconciliation. And this will bring me to the substantive core of my talk today, the measurement of reconciliation. As we've heard earlier this morning, there appears to be a global frenzy to balance moral ledgers. Talk of apology, forgiveness, and reconciliation is everywhere. And yet, as we have also seen, no agreement exists on what is required for coming to terms with the past, especially violent pasts. This disagreement is partly due to the fact that reconciliation, very much like apology and forgiveness, as we've heard, has been conceptualized and operationalized with insufficient rigor to balance moral ledgers or to increase our understanding of them. This has had consequences of reconciliation both as a category of analysis and a category of practice. The consequences um, of conceptualization are highly significant for the language of reconciliation may imply not only a shared moral fabric, but one much thicker than that which may, than that which may actually exist. And I shall argue this is really the case in South Africa. Um, thus, it has the potential to coerce individuals into compliant positions they would not adopt of their own volition. And just in an aside, we might think of the American Civil War and the kind of reconciliation that happened afterwards as an instance of, of coerced reconciliation um, as well, where North and South reconciled at the expense of the um, question of, um, of slavery, for example. Now, in an attempt to penetrate the complexity of reconciliation, I've elsewhere traced the genealogy of the term and taken issue with the proliferation of meanings in recent scholarship. Um, in an effort at structuring a useful debate on possible and impossible departures from violence, I formulated in that work, uh, as Professor Sharp indicated, a systematized concept of reconciliation based on the multitude of meanings that can be found in theory and practice. I distinguish varieties of reconciliation and organize these into various types and subtypes 
Um, but the intricacies of my work need not concern us here. Um, but allow me to sketch for you in broad outline my concept of reconciliation. Now, in everyday life, reconciliation means different things to different people, as exemplified, for example, by the entries in the Oxford English Dictionary, the OED. The first available entry in the OED's second edition of 1989 defines reconciliation as the, quote, action of reconciling persons or the result of this, the fact of being reconciled. Um, this is the first usage found in 1386. <laughs> Subsequent entries refer to the, quote, reunion of a person to church, unquote, 1625, the, quote, purification or restoration of sacred uses, uses of a church, etc., after desecra desecration or pollution, unquote. This is 1533. Um, the form of these meanings is characteristic of religious interpretations which portray reconciliation primarily as the solemn and public act of readmitting into church membership an excommunicated sinner. The remaining entries speak of the, quote, action of bringing to agreement concord or harmony, unquote, this is from 1560, and the, quote, practice of rendering one account consistent with another by balancing apparent discrepancies, unquote, 1895. The verb to reconcile has seen a wider usage over the centuries. The collected meanings range from bringing a person, quote, again into friendly relations to or with oneself or another after an estrangement, 1382, to bringing, quote, back into concord to reunite persons or things in harmony, 1429, and from efforts at restoring to purity to absolve or cleanse, 1430, to bringing into a state of acquiescence with or submission to a thing, 1606. So, although noteworthy, um, uh, while comprehensive, the conventional meanings are just reiterated of reconciliation are inadequate for really furthering explanation or understanding in any systematic fashion at least, and, and I claim that a systematic understanding is what we should be all after. Um, now, instead I build what um, some other scholars refer to as a systematized concept of reconciliation. Um, this involved the selection of shared and foundational attributes of reconciliation assembled from the broad constellation of meanings that have become associated with the term um, through a universe of so-called background concepts. And these included concepts such as equilibrium solutions uh, drawn from the anthropology of law, for example, conciliation, resolution, restoration, uh, many terms that, that, uh, that will be familiar to those uh, here in the room. Now, my objective was not to exclude from consideration alternative conceptions of reconciliation, and here my approach mirrors a little bit the one taken by Professor Smith uh, on apology, but rather the objective was to formulate a concept to which other concepts can be compared and against which the practice of reconciliation can be measured. So, in other words, mine is a pragmatic approach to choices about concepts. For the wider the world under investigation, in geographical as well as temporal terms, the more we need conceptual tools that are able to travel. Frequently, scholars, notably those, those of reconciliation, follow the, least line, uh, the line of least resistance. They broaden the meaning and thereby the range of application of the conceptualizations at hand. In other words, the larger the world, the more scholars have resorted to what some have called conceptual stretching. The problem of conceptual stretching resurfaces in the study of reconciliation, for the term has been applied to a large universe of phenomena ranging from mere coexistence to the genuine restoration of relations among former adversaries. Now, the net result of conceptual stretching is that gains in denotative coverage tend to be matched by losses in connotative precision. We cover more in traveling terms only by saying less and by saying less in a far less precise manner. For example, by defining reconciliation as an agreement, quote, among antagonistic subjects to depart from violence in a shared present, as John Bonemann does, is guilty of conceptual stretching. Again, he says, reconciliation is an agreement among antagonistic subjects to depart from violence in a shared present. He says, that is reconciliation. I say, that is conceptual stretching. Um, so the problem of conceptual stretching arises either when a concept is applied to cases for, it, for which it is not, not appropriate, or secondly, when a concept is defined so broadly that it would cover situations for which it is not appropriate. Um, 
The latter is a problem of stretching uh, that can arise in studies that have no empirical referent. And Bonemann's definition of reconciliation falls into this category. His conceptualization as an agreement among antagonistic subjects and so on is so broad as to be meaningless. It covers everything from the reconciliation agreement um, of 403, 402 BC in Athens, which led to the restoration of democracy, to the Treaty of Versailles, which led to everything but democracy. Uh, and also, he doesn't uh, pay any attention to the state of mind of the person engaging or the persons engaging in reconciliation. So I would say these two examples, Athens and Versailles, uh, neither was an instance of reconciliation, but rather of re-equilibration, which is something altogether different, far less demanding, and I will talk more about this. Now, I believe the problem of conceptual stretching is of particular significance in the context of reconciliation because of the normative dimensions of the concept. The effect of excessive conceptual stretching is the erosion of reconciliation's normative connotation. With this in mind, I propose the following systematized concept of reconciliation. Reconciliation refers to the accommodation of former adversaries through mutually conciliatory means requiring both forgiveness and mercy. Interestingly, mercy hasn't come up at all today, and, and I actually find it quite useful um, for my discussion of reconciliation. Where forgiveness connotes the forswearing of resentment, the resolute overcoming of the anger and hatred that are naturally linked, uh, directed toward a person who has done one, an unjustified, who has done an unjustified and non-excused moral injury and mercy connotes the extension of an act of compassion to the undeserving person who has committed an unjustified and non-excused moral injury. The details don't really uh, need, need not concern us here because I won't go into, into that direction. But uh, at the bottom, the bottom line is reconciliation requires both forgiveness and mercy. And incidentally, I disagree with Professor Griswold's uh, bilateral conception um, uh, of forgiveness, and I adopt the unilateral one, which follows up on the question that was raised earlier. I believe um, only the person who was wronged is actually relevant for our discussion of forgiveness. The outcome is really, or the other side is really uh, irrelevant on my reading of it. So, but I'm not really interested in the definition per se. Um, I'm more interested in pushing onward to make a larger, a far less abstract point. Um, but suffice it to say that the incorporation of both forgiveness and mercy into my concept of reconciliation makes this phenomenon epistemolo epistemologically excuse me, demanding. Uh, and this innovation is deliberate. If reconciliation uh, is to retain its connotation as an ultimate value, we must, I believe, rein in the conceptualization of uh, this phenomenon as a category of analysis and, and practice. So we have to have more modest goals. And it's for this reason that I came up with my concept, which I take to be a, a narrow or maximalist uh, conception of reconciliation. Uh, it calls for nothing less, essentially, than an ethics of caring for the enemy. Now, this also underlines the consensual and voluntary nature of reconciliation, as I theorize it. Absent either of these conditions, the accommodation of differences is coexistence at best. So forgiveness and mercy and it has to be consensual and voluntary as well. And I think this excludes many cases that we have deemed success stories of reconciliation. Now, reconciliation will be consensual, I believe, if all affected parties choose to pursue accommodation. For reconciliation to be consensual, it need not involve the settlement of underlying discordance. The necessity of consensus relates to the process of accommodation rather than its substance. And this is somewhat reminiscent of Jürgen Habermas' uh, notion of, um, of procedural democracy, if you like, um, and what he outlined in his theory of communicative action. Um, okay, reconciliation will be voluntary, as I see it, if all of the affected parties choose to pursue accommodation out of their own volition. To be reconciled with a person is to accept that person as someone with whom one could cooperate in shared projects placing aside feelings of hostility or injury that might make such cooperation impossible. The requirement of voluntariness is often honored in the breach, and this is particularly true uh, about Rwanda, and I'd be happy to talk about this in the question and answer period. Uh, but another example is the debate over the Jedwabne uh, massacre in Poland. Um, and you may have heard about this, this case. A book was written by... Um, uh, uh, 
uh, gross about this, this massacre with Princeton, uh, and one contributor to this debate over this massacre in, in Poland identified traps of premature forgiveness. And she noted that forgiveness cannot be forced upon a group representing the victims. In the opinion of this commentator, such forgiveness cannot lead to real reconciliation. And this brings me back to the cases with which I began, especially the case of South Africa. Now, returning to the measurement of reconciliation, the principal, current, uh, principal concern of operationalization or measurement differs from that of conceptualization. Uh, and I just talked about the concept, and I will stop talking about the concept and move on to the measurement question. Now, whereas conceptualization asks, what are we talking about? Operationalization is concerned with the question, how do we know it when we see it? Now, having defined what reconciliation is and is not, how do we capture its presence or absence in social life? On the basis of my concept or any other concept, what indicators are necessary to produce scores for empirical cases? Or is reconciliation, as one observer noted, uh, a concept that cannot be measured? I maintain it might be hard, but if we are um, interested in making inroads and actually designing policy, we better have standards that actually allow us to uh, ascertain whether or not our policies or prescriptions are successful or not. Absent such standards, we might as well not engage in these uh, activities, precisely because they often may have unintended consequences. They may actually make matters worse. And this is actually something that happened in Rwanda. It happens in many other contexts where well-meaning people prescribe policies um, that lead to further suffering, not less suffering. So while this commitment to reconciliation is a good thing, its pursuit or uh, its prescription as a policy may not always be advisable. It may not be advisable as such. It may not be advisable at a given moment in time. And I think we ought to be able um, to, to realize when and why and how reconciliation uh, may not be coming about. Now, uh, in an attempt to provide a tentative answer to the question of how we know when we see it, I'll briefly examine James Gibson's extensive work on the salience of reconciliation in South Africa. Uh, James Gibson, as I mentioned, teaches at Washington, and his um, two books on South Africa, and there's another one forthcoming, and his various articles, are the first really um, sustained attempt to move in this direction. He's the very first person to really take this question of measurement seriously. I think he errs in many respects, as you will see, but I think um, his effort is, um, is laudable and is, distinguishes him from much of the, what I would describe, like touchy-feely discourse about reconciliation that is pervasive out there. Um, so by relying on Gibson's work or by, by uh, um, sharing it with you, um, I'm able to exemplify some of the operational difficulties uh, scholars face in measuring reconciliation. And also, uh, it allows me to put to exemplary use my concept that I just uh, sketched for you in the preceding part. In its uh, five-volume report, the TRC of South Africa distinguished a number of human relationships that required restoration qua reconciliation, namely, and I quote here, relationships of individuals with themselves, relationships between victims, relationships between survivors and perpetrators, within families, between neighbors, and within and between communities, relationships within different institutions, between different generations, between racial and ethnic groups, between workers and management, and above all, between the beneficiaries of apartheid and those who have been disadvantaged by it. This echoes the previously introduced distinction between, uh, and I didn't talk about it much, but between types of reconciliation and subtypes, and the utility of distinguishing among subtypes. And um, the TSC has failed in many regards because it didn't actually take seriously um, the notion with which it was primarily concerned, namely reconciliation. Uh, it didn't distingu distinguish among any of these and set itself up for failure, essentially. Um, and I'm, not, I'm not the only person to, to say so. Um, so the TSC fell short, and due to political and organizational dynamics, of advancing a working definition, um, a definition that would have made it possible to measure progress in the realization uh, of its mandate, i.e., the achievement of truth and reconciliation in a divided society such as South Africa. Um, as one observer writes, defining exactly what was meant by reconciliation remained one of the great incomplete tasks of the commission. Now this brings us to the, one of the major challenges involved in the measurement of reconciliation, namely the necessity of inference 
Because it is impossible to define the phenomenon of reconciliation in terms of the operations that are used to measure it, any research design must rely on inferred measurement rather than direct measurement. Right? Uh, in the most systematic attempt yet, Gibson, in a multivariate analysis of survey data, measured the salience of reconciliation, especially between racial groups. So he only took like one of these relationships that the TSC believed had to be restored. In his book, um, Overcoming Apartheid, Gibson defined a reconciled South African as someone, quote, who trusts and is respectful of those of different races, who is tolerant of her or his political enemies, who is committed to protecting human rights through the, through the rule of law, and who extends legitimacy to the political institutions of the new South Africa. Succinctly put, Gibbs, uh, Gibson views reconciliation as a product of interracial reconciliation, political tolerance, a human rights culture, and institutional legitimacy. To illustrate problems of measurement in overcoming apartheid in his book, uh, and difficulties in the measurement of reconciliation more generally, uh, I hone in on the first two of what Gibson interchangeably refers to as subdimensions and levels of reconciliation, namely interracial reconciliation and political tolerance. Uh, and by so doing, I hope to make a stronger case for a maximalist conception of reconciliation. Let me begin with Gibson's subdimension of interracial reconciliation. To measure what he calls interracial reconciliation, Gibson used the replies of about 4,000 respondents to nine survey statements about other racial groups. And these other racial groups were African whites, so-called coloreds, and Asians as indicators of interracial reconciliation. Respondents were asked to agree or disagree with statements about other groups ranging from it is difficult to understand their ways to they are untrustworthy and from they are selfish and only look after themselves to they are more likely to engage in crime. From the responses to these statements, Gibson created what he called a reconciliation index. Um, and by subtracting the number of unreconciled responses from the number of reconciled responses. Um, nearly half of the black respondents are scored as less reconciled, while roughly one third of the whites are less reconciled. Colored respondents were the most likely to hold racially reconciled attitudes, while a, plura a, pl a plurality of whites and not of Asian origin expressed more reconciled viewpoints. Now, Gibson, in other words, and these, the, the outcome doesn't really need to concern us. I'm more after um, the way he went about measuring reconciliation. Now, Gibson defined what he termed interracial reconciliation in minimalist terms. Inasmuch as positive attitudes toward another group are facilitative in the process of reconciliation, I believe they're neither necessary nor sufficient for concluding it. The requirement of forgiveness and mercy, my requirement, um, on the other hand, requires more from subjects of reconciliation than a mere understanding of the customs and ways of adversaries. That was his first indicator. A belief in what adversaries say, his third indicator, or a willingness to attend a party with these adversaries. That was the seventh indicator he used. For it is not at all inconceivable, I believe, for a respondent to appreciate the culture of adversaries or to take seriously these adversaries without being reconciled with them, whether individually or collectively. And I believe by entering the requirement of forgiveness and mercy, uh, interracial reconciliation becomes less easily attainable. Now, based on uh, his data that he culled from a, a 2001 survey, Gibson concluded that interracial reconciliation in South Africa, quote, is perhaps more common than might be expected in light of the country's history of racism and racial separation and domination. However, if we operationalize reconciliation in terms of forgiveness and mercy, the bar for reconciliation would be set considerably higher. Consequently, measurement of reconciliation in South Africa would in all probability generate less favorable results than I reported in Gibson's quantitative analysis. Um, and I will not bore you with indicators that might be used in order to, to get at the questions that I would ask. I'll just sort of skip forward. Um, and um, overall, I, I would say that um, a comprehensive survey research based on different concepts than the one that Gibson used um, might show a lower salience of reconciliation in South Africa than the data collected by Gibson. Uh, and there's qualitative data to bear out this fact. Uh, 
there's various anthropologists who have gone to townships and have talked to hostel dwellers um, and have, have made this claim, found evidence for the claim that basically this uh, the achievement of reconciliation was rather superficial in South Africa. Now, um, be that as it may, at least it raises questions about the um, the desirability of transplanting this much heralded institution to other contexts, especially to transplant it without any um, uh, amendments, if you will. Uh, and I'm mentioning these things, uh, they seem to be obvious, but they really aren't, because if you talk about Rwanda, for instance, which I know, which I know best, um, this idea was contemplated very seriously. People have written about this. There have been many, many delegations uh, were sent to Cape Town and Johannesburg to, to explore the possibilities of having a truth commission in, in Rwanda and so on. So um, these things actually have real world meaning um, because people sort of, there's a certain contagion effect that is going on. And that's why these questions are not just academic, they really cut at the heart um, of international policy in this domain as well. Like one anthropologist writes about townships in the Val Triangle, the townships I worked in, he says, quote, reconciliation through truth was never likely to achieve more than the restoration of social relationships between victims, between victims, where suspicion and stigma had been wrongfully attached to one person or a family. Um, now, in keeping with this, other scholarship has found a widespread desire for revenge that continues or at least resurfaces, uh, and this sort of calls into question some of the quantitative findings reported by, by Gibson. Um, so this, this, this comparison, this brief comparison highlights um, the problem or the issue of measurement uh, variation that can result from divergent methodological choices. Um, an argument can be made that the indicators that Gibson used to score interracial reconciliation in South Africa measured the salience of tolerance rather than reconciliation. Which brings me to the second of Gibson's sub-dimensions of reconciliation. Um, because tolerance is a key element in his four-pronged concept of reconciliation. Um, there's a couple of tensions because he doesn't actually define them properly. Sometimes he, he talks about tolerance uh, as being synonymous with reconciliation. Then he looks at it as a cause, then as a consequence. So it's very muddled conceptually, uh, which bears out my previous point. At best, scholarship thus far sows conceptual confusion. At worst, it actually impedes practical responses to injustice. Um, now, while it is reasonable to assume that democracies require a tolerant citizenry, uh, Gibson's defense of a minimalist conception of reconciliation in terms of tolerance creates rather than reduces conceptual confusion. For the requisites of democracy, at least I would say, are epiphenomenal to the conceptualization of reconciliation. Um, despite an important relationship, the consequences should not be mistaken for the concept itself. Um, now, equating the two concepts, I believe, distorts measurement of reconciliation salience in South Africa. What uh, Gibson measures under the umbrella of tolerance is not synonymous with reconciliation, but a phenomenon that is epistemolo epistemologically less demanding. It's, it's easier to be tolerant than to be reconciled with someone. And I think if you think about your personal context, uh, you will very quickly find evidence for that. Um, and again, also one major reason is that tolerance is a, is a unilateral um, act, whereas reconciliation, is, the way I conceive it, requires uh, actions from two different parties, which makes it, again, more demanding uh, than tolerance. Um, now, and this brings me to the limits of minimalist conceptions of reconciliation more generally. Um, the problem with minimalist conceptions uh, becomes evident if you turn once again to South Africa. Uh, measurement on all four sub-dimensions of Gibson's reconciliation index resulted in the following mean scores. 59% of so-called colored South Africans, 56% of white South Africans, 48% of Asians, and 33% of Africans are scored as reconciled. Overall, Gibson finds that about 44% of South Africans are somewhat reconciled, celebrating this as an unexpectedly high level of reconciliation. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Um, in, as much as, in as much as Gibson's operationalization, operationalization of his concept um, is logically sound, the scores derived from his indicators can be meaningfully interpreted, um, and, and they can be interpreted. It is arguably empirically problematic for some of the reasons that I mentioned before, and I will just skip this section uh, in the interest of time. Um, 
Now, while Gibson's indicators um, are well suited to measuring the state of sustainable democracy in South Africa, they are less well suited to measuring the salience of reconciliation. Uh, as he notes, uh, and he, he admits this much when he discusses uh, a township called Sharpville in South Africa, where much of the violence actually transpired uh, during apartheid, he concedes this fact. Um, and aside from the stories of reconciliation failure uh, abound in South Africa, and sort of in the side you might consider a number of cases brought by families of victims that were brought before the South African Constitutional Court, and all of this at least paints a far more complicated picture um, than Gibson is able to, to paint from a macro perspective without actually doing the kind of interpretive research that Wilson and others, and I believe, are necessary for truly getting also the, at the meaning of reconciliation, not in a definitional sense, but in the meaning, uh, in the anthropological sense, like the meaning of uh, reconciliation for people on the ground, because again, it might be in the eye of the beholder what that really means. Uh, and I think sort of these various uh, quantitative uh, attempts have thus far at least failed. I'm not suggesting they're, um, they're uh, uh, impossible to do. They can be done carefully, and I think they should be done. However, we should not, um, I think, uh, accept at face value of these results without actually knowing the context about which we're talking. This brings me back about Rwanda. Um, we often um, see commentators, especially around this month, talk about the achievement of reconciliation because you have, as a result of the operation of these so-called kachacha jurisdictions, uh, perpetrators uh, sentenced to community service, helping victims to rebuild their houses, and this is celebrated as an act of reconciliation. I think it's nonsense. Uh, it may very well be in, in select instances, but if you actually know the country and you're familiar with dynamics in the country and the history, this is in most cases not what it is. Uh, and many Rwandans also tell me to the extent that they can actually talk openly because we shouldn't forget Rwanda is an authoritarian regime at the hands of which indirectly or directly millions of people have died since the genocide. Um, so many Rwandans tell me also, well, we have no choice. There's nothing else to do but to reconcile. It's a tiny country. It's one of the poorest in the world. Um, so this goes to the meaning of reconciliation. If people just have no choice but to sort of build these houses and talk to one another, is it really reconciliation or is it maybe just coexistence? And then again, coexistence, I think, is a great thing. I think we should not always aim for reconciliation. Again, my being German comes into play as well. Um, I think reconciliation is an immeasurably difficult thing to have, process to initiate, an outcome to bring about. Uh, and I think it should be an ultimate value. Um, and I think that's a good thing. And coexistence should not be undervalued. Because if we otherwise uh, construct institutions from the UN ad hoc tribunals, um, that also um, uh, reference has been made that they should be contributing to the maintenance of international peace and security, of course, because of Chapter 7 of the UN Charter when they were created, but other kinds of aspirations are read into their operation, um, I think we set these institutions up for failure. The same as truth commissions. By virtue of the fact that reconciliation, the achievement of, and you heard these different relations, of individual and national reconciliation was part of the mandate, the institution was set up for failure. No institution can accomplish this. You can lay the, the groundwork for these kinds of uh, processes to, to unfold, but no institution uh, in the span of two or three years can bring about, uh, bring about such a complicated um, human um, relationship. Um, and I will close in a, uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, so while, while none of what I've presented so far uh, is sufficient evidence to falsify Gibson's conclusions about South Africa, uh, this, the discussion has hopefully shown that my concept constitutes an expanded procedural minimum uh, conception and, and why a research design built around this conception promises to measure a different reality of reconciliation than alternatives currently in existence. I'm not claiming mine is the best definition by no means. And this, is, this goes back to what uh, Professor Smith said as well about apology. I think our attempts are very similar in the sense that we simply want to um, create a broader framework that allows people to make deliberate, careful choices about concepts before they actually reach conclusions about history. And I think we haven't reached this state yet. Uh, people are far uh, too willing to reach conclusions about the absence or presence of forgiveness or reconciliation or any of these others, other morally Latin terms. Um, now, at a minimum, the discussion should have illustrated how differences in the conceptualization of reconciliation can potentially lead to radically different results about the presence and absence of the phenomenon. And I think that's the key takeaway uh, from my lecture today, that um, we may, it's not about the 
absence or presence of a certain phenomenon, you actually may just measure it completely differently. And this may then influence the way you think about uh, the success of certain policies that were enacted or, or not enacted. Uh, so I therefore contend that, um, that Gibson's measurements suggest a shared moral fabric uh, considerably thicker than that which may, based on some of the qualitative data, actually exist in South Africa. And I therefore contend that Gibson, like Bonham and earlier, is guilty of conceptual stretching. Um, so to conclude, to the extent that the quantitative analysis of reconciliation is important and indispensable part of studying the consequences of collective violence, it should be complemented with studies that take a smaller n as their unit of analysis, be it a village or some other form of local community. So you might think about Cambodia, another case I've studied. Um, you might inquire into the meaning of reconciliation in Cambodia. You might talk about forgiveness and mercy uh, as a starting point, as just a standard against which to measure uh, local understandings, but then ask yourself, well, do forgiveness and mercy play any role in Cambodia and society? They may not at all, right, whatsoever. And then you have to sort of take that into account by what, by wh how can we measure it? How can we see it when it happens? And we can't transplant very simply a concept that makes sense in, in our Christian uh, or other uh, or Jewish tradition or so on. We have to actually be attuned to local pe uh, uh, pe uh, specifics and, and uh, peculiarities. This is not a call for moral relativism, by no, by no means, um, but I think we have, to be, we have to be able to understand the societies which we study. Um, otherwise, we may actually uh, find something that's not really absent at all. It just, it's just present to the extent that it conforms uh, with some ideological construct we have about this phenomenon. Um, now, by studying these smaller communities, um, we would ensure that researchers truly understand in the barbarian sense, right, sort of em em emphatic reading of a given situation, make headway toward the measurement of reconciliation, ultimately the pursuit of reconciliation, the policy of reconciliation. Like the combination of nomothetic and ideographic reasoning uh, promises to be a useful strategy in the study of reconciliation, um, specifically for attenuating um, these operational difficulties scholars face. Um, and I've tried to exemplify some of these difficulties today by placing Gibson's pioneering analysis, and again, by notwithstanding anything I've said, I still believe it is a pioneering analysis and an, uh, uh, a groundbreaking work um, that requires engagement. But nevertheless, um, 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 by placing it alongside a hypothetical analysis informed by different concepts like my own, um, that reconciliation uh, uh, requires for the study. Now, the discussion of these two systematized concepts, Gibson's and mine, was meant to illustrate the importance of distinguishing um, issues of measurement, operationalization, from issues of meaning, conceptualization. And unfortunately, time constraints disallow a comprehensive analysis of this and other issues involved in the study of reconciliation. Um, but the remarks and measurement that are presented uh, were meant to complement the focus on, on the concept in the earlier part. Uh, operationalization, uh, as Professor Sharp um, quoted me earlier, is the linchpin that connects categories and cases or ideas and facts and constitutes a methodological task second only to that of conceptualization. And as far as the latter is concerned, I firmly believe that the formulation of realistic concepts, one scholar, Susan Dwyer, talks about realistic concepts of reconciliation that are more attainable in practice, um, is counterproductive. I don't think we are, we are not served well by having attainable concepts in practice. For I believe if reconciliation is everywhere, it is nowhere. Thank you. Um, this, this concept of, of reconciliation, um, it's like, is, isn't uh, two prerequisites of, uh, of toward reconciliation uh, being one, a, a, a movement toward economic equality and, and two, a, an atmosphere of, of friendship and respect, I mean, if it, if, if people are, are getting poorer I instead of richer, um, and, the, and there isn't an atmosphere of, of friendship and, and respect, then, then how can there be reconciliation? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Um, I would say that the achievement of 
um, or the reduction of economic disparity or the attenuation of poverty are all desirable um, um, processes and outcomes, and they will certainly facilitate, I think, or they may facilitate a movement towards reconciliation. But I, I personally wouldn't say that they are necessary um, attributes of reconciliation. The same with friendship. I think friendship um, is a concept related to reconciliation, but not necessary. I think if friendship were the goal, it would be even more demanding. Um, and I think enemies need not be friends in order to be reconciled. I think it is about the underlying issue that, that drove uh, adversaries apart that needs to be addressed. I think it need not go as far as, as, as friendship uh, in order to constitute uh, an instance of reconciliation. I, I guess I have the microphone. <laughs> is it working? It is working, yes. Uh, fine. I'd just uh, like to add to your remarks because I think they really could perhaps punctuate them. Some of my own observations about uh, attending the Truth and Reconciliation mm -hmm. Commission hearings I went in 1998 when the TRC was winding down. It was maybe the last few hearings before they wrote up their report. And uh, I went to Mamalodi, a, a township outside of Pretoria, in this giant auditorium, where on one side of the auditorium was a microphone marked Susutu. And all the Africans were sitting over there. Probably, indeed, some of them had buttons that read family of victim. And on the other side, a dozen white people. I sat among the Africans as a small token of solidarity, but I also wanted to get the vibes from them, what they were doing and saying as the testimony took place. First of all, they were 40 meters from the testimony, divided by a big space, those who testified were up on the stage. It, there just was no way these people could relate to what was happening. And moreover, the way the tables were arranged, they couldn't even see because there were television cameras in the way and so forth. It just wasn't physically set up to bring about reconciliation in any fashion whatsoever. These, this hearing involved 10 police officers who were accused of torturing to death, disposing of the body, and then planning the cover-up of one relatively small potatoes operative for the ANC. The testimony went on for hours. Tremendous detail about the torture. It was unsettling for me. And not only did they not testify voluntarily, it had to be pulled out of them by lawyers for the commission who were able to see flaws and to bring them to attention. All sorts of excuses. I can't remember. Oh, my, my testimony is an Afrikaans, and you're asking me in English. I don't understand that. All those sorts of things. In that sense, I got the feeling that the TRC was failing miserably in bringing out the truth of this operation. And in fact, uh, when I read in the paper several days later, or uh, actually several weeks later, that these men had gained their uh, immunity by this non-voluntary testimony, I really was upset, but it had failed. Uh, there was no apology, no remorse, they stonewalled continually. They had lawyers on hand that you knew were telling them, don't say that, because what you're doing is creating a record that may enter into a criminal or, or a civil procedure later. And so it wasn't what it was cracked up to be. Now, in that sense, evaluating the TRC, I would say, means that you have to evaluate several TRCs. In the beginning, the testimony came from the victims and the families of the victims, in which, during that testimony, names came up. And if you were a cop and your name came up early on, you'd better seek immunity as quickly as you can. And so the first wave of those who sought immunity were people who wanted to tell their story and wanted reconciliation. 
The second wave were those reluctant characters who had no sense of remorse, but who were protecting their tails. And in that sense, we have two, at least two TRCs in operation. And I think at that point has never been brought out to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting account. I think you're absolutely right. That um, I like the idea of like, different TRCs, and they certainly existed in, in, in various respects as well, because um, you can look at it differently, even in the sense that you had the TRC committed to, again, uncovering the truth um, and also giving like voice, as it were, to, to victims. Uh, and there's others that are more after forensic truth. Uh, and you described... Uh, uh, perfectly the dynamic that often obtained, namely that, um, and this goes back to criticism I mentioned in passing, excessive legalism. What was not a legal institution, except it was created by way of law, became uh, a legal institution and sort of, uh, you had dynamics where, where you had uh, kind of adversarial proceedings going on, where lawyers were advising um, their, their clients, essentially, and that sort of undermined um, the search for historical truth, basically. So that was one TRC, the one that sort of may have failed in, and this goes back to the criticism of the report as well, the one that failed maybe in really set, creating a record, or it may have created a, some kind of record, but not the record it set out to be. And the other one that sort of tried to deal with questions of, of um, guilt, responsibility, and so on. And there was also, uh, in terms of the organization of the institution, was very interesting. There was a, a tension that existed between the research department of the TRC um, and between the Human Rights Violations Committee. Uh, and this goes back to this, this very same issue. The research department was very interested in, when they went out of the field and collected testimony, for example, to also give people a chance to tell their stories. And that was, they, had, they had sort of nice forms that had to be filled out, and that makes sense to create a database. Initially, this form had a section where um, victim survivors could tell their story. It was a fairly big chunk, and they could fill it out. And this was a way of you know, catharsis, like moving towards catharsis. Then, in response to some criticism by the lawyers in the Human Rights Violations Committee, um, this section was struck because, A, it was inefficient. It took too long to gather this data. And secondly, it didn't have any justicial value, essentially. It wasn't anything relevant to the way lawyers operate. And this sort of uh, points to like an inherent tension in this, in this institution, and which is not to say it was not really um, set up in a way to, um, to serve victims, but it became something over time. So I like the idea of different TRCs, whether temporally, organizationally, it definitely was formed, transformed, deformed, um, and I think we would be well advised to follow your, your suggestion to to unpack this evolution of it, as opposed to treating it as this, this black box that either succeeded or failed. Because I also don't want to, to be understood as saying that this was a complete failure. I think it wasn't. We just need to have, I think, a different or paint a differentiated picture um, of this institution's performance. Okay, we have a question here and then Charles. I'd like to ask a question about Rwanda. Mm -hmm. If it's only coexistence and not reconciliation, what do we have to look forward to? I was in Rwanda a year ago, a very, very impressive country, lots of good things happening over there. And Rwandan families, and I'm very close to here, who have been through absolutely the worst of the genocide, unbelievable people, have come here. The thing that shocks me is how absolutely positive they are, how happy they seem to be, how they've reestablished families. I wonder how they can be as positive as they are, considering what their background has been. Uh, through that horrible genocide. My question is, if it was only coexistence and not reconciliation, is this just suppressed enough that we're up for more problems in the future? And how can we avoid that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think, again, to, to be a little more differentiated, I'm not suggesting that reconciliation has not happened at all. It may well have happened in some individual instances, but my overall impression is that it hasn't really transpired. And the happiness you describe, um, I'm not suggesting it doesn't exist, but um, having known the country a bit, um, this is a uh, pretense for the most part, for a number of different reasons. Uh, years and years of living, I mean, I've known this family 10 years, I've seen no I'm not suggesting in, in your particular, this may vary, I'm just sort of generally speaking, A, and this is very similar to, like, when I first went to Rwanda and I sat down, I came from Burundi, um, and I went on the ground, I felt immediately at home. And I realized later this was because I was German. The country is, is very akin to Germany in the respects of like, order, obedience, authority. All of this is very important. And um, as a white person who's introduced as a, uh, 
or any foreigner for them, it doesn't even have to be a white person. I have a very good African-American colleague who went to South Africa and he felt white for the first time in his life because he was treated as if he were white, not black. Um, but in any event, um, anybody would be considered an authority figure. Uh, Rwanda is a very violent country that is a repressive state, so people have to be very careful uh, what they say at any moment in time. And it's very difficult to know what will ever get back to, to whom at what point in time. So you're better off, again, this is a general argument, you're better off to suggesting things are peachy in Rwanda than in any way even um, allude to any problems that might exist. And I have a number of people um, who've been detained. I have a few people who we brought to Harvard as, as so-called scholars at risk um, who are, whose names appear on death lists um, for nothing more than simply criticizing the regime. Uh, and uh, President Kagame was supposed to come to Harvard on the 20th for, for a debate um, with me and my colleagues. He has now postponed it. Um, but the regime is, is not very keen um, on, on being challenged, um, and any challenges will be met with met very swiftly, especially in the country. Uh, and the country is tiny; it's the size of like what is it, Connecticut? Maybe it's really tiny. It can be very easily governed, uh, and this is a tradition that, that goes back like since colonial times and even before that. Um, this is a very dense network of of repression that covers the country. So you can't really be sure that whoever you're talking to is not going to squeal on you, so to speak. I'm not suggesting this happens in your case. I'm not suggesting, and many Iranians do believe in, 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 uh, in advances, obviously. And the country, I should also say, um, has been impressive in terms of uh, economic restructuring, in terms of, for example, fostering um, uh, uh, satellite technology and, and telephone networks. And there's like a new, a new plan was revealed in 2008 in December about how Kigali is going to be changed and rebuilt in the next 20 years. A new airport is being, going to be built. Um, there's a lot of positive development, but this often is at odds with, for example, the way in which survivors are treated. Genocide survivors uh, um, do complain that they're second-class citizens, um, that sort of their issues are not usually met. And this is often, this, this gets lost in the US, uh, whether you read New York Times reporting or any other major news stories. There are different types of Rwandans, different types of Tutsi as well, and they're not all on the same level, and they're not sort of all have similar uh, preferences or ideas or interests about the future of the country. Um, and the second part of your question, I'm sorry I'm, I'm going on a bit, but I feel rather passionately about this, and especially at this month uh, of each year, uh, I sort of try to counter some of the, the narratives that that are being um, disseminated uh, in the media about Rwanda and sort of the necessary necessity of repentance on the part of the international community and so on. I think um, that there is much to be said about that. But how, what do we do? Um, it's, it's hard to say. I think collective violence is not um, off the agenda. Um, many people you speak to also in Kigali, it feels differently now. It feels very odd, um, and um, people believe that a military coup could be in the offing at some point, and not one that, that sort of revolves around ethnic lines. Uh, people believe that the next uh, instance of violence would probably be a military coup um, that might be directed at the Kagame regime and combine H uh, Hutu and Tutsi elements. Um, so I don't think that violence is off the table at all. Um, I don't think um, any of these developments actually um, have deep enough roots to prevent um, us from returning uh, to collective violence. What is to be done? Um, I would say the U.S. is a particularly uh, important role to play in this because the U.S. is like the major, a major donor and business partner of Rwanda. Uh, and Kagame also comes to the U.S. I call it his stomping ground um, because the U.S. is Rwanda's closest ally. So there's a lot of leverage that can be exercised over, say, the treatment of opposition politicians or, for example, uh, the, the ban on, on independent human rights organizations that de facto existed could be lifted. Uh, that not everybody should be painted with a brush of so-called divisionism or inciting genocidal ideology because he or she criticizes the regime. Um, this is condoned by the international community, and I think this is one way to, to push against this. Um, not so much just to criticize the regime, but also to, to signal to others who may be thinking of a violent overthrow that there may be other channels that, that are not entirely um, foreclosed yet. Um. We have one more, and then we'll have to break for the next Thanks for the most interesting talk. Um, I'm puzzled by your definition of reconciliation. Uh, you said that forgiveness and mercy and I think care for the enemy are necessary conditions for reconciliation. And it seems to me that there are a number of good reasons not to accept that. 
Um, I'll just name a couple of them. Mm -hmm. First, uh, you said correctly that um, reconciliation is bilateral. You can't be reconciled with somebody who's not reconciled with you. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you said that forgiveness, which is one of the necessary conditions for it, is not bilateral, it's unilateral. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a problem in combining those, those two. Secondly, your definition seems to rule out cases of reconciliation that we would normally uh, want to count as reconciliation, for example, between the United States and Vietnam. I'm talking about reconciliation between nations. But cases in which there hasn't really been forgiveness, or there may not have been forgiveness, mm -hmm. in which case forgiveness can't be a necessary condition of reconciliation. So I mm -hmm. wonder why we should accept your, what's an implicit demand that we drastically revise our use of the term. Mm -hmm. um, thirdly, I'm not sure that it really makes any sense to talk about forgiveness in a political sphere when we're talking about nations, um, except in a very metaphorical sense. Uh, we don't really talk about you know, the United States forgiving um, somebody, another nation. I'm very suspicious of that kind of talk, mm -hmm. but you would have to accept it, and I think that's quite problematic. Um, and finally, with the, in terms of the measurement issue, which is your issue, um, if you do build in forgiveness as you have, it seems to me you doom the possibility of quantitative measurement. I mean, how are you going to measure forgiveness if forgiveness has anything to do with a kind of change of self and a giving up of a, an emotion, mm -hmm. especially on the political level? So I think in a way what you've done is to take a conception of reconciliation that may be appropriate in the interpersonal sphere and you've transplanted it to the political sphere, but in ways that end up to be self-defeating. Mm -hmm. These are excellent uh, points and questions. Uh, naturally, I disagree with um, everything you've said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but these are nevertheless very... But they're, but, they're, but they're very challenging points, and, and they're not easy to answer. But, but let me take a crack at it, nevertheless. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. I don't, I, let me start this. There's different levels of reconciliation types and subtypes. And uh, individual collective is, is the most basic distinction. And within each, you have local, regional, national, international. Um, I, I would say, um, and again, I haven't talked about this at all, but I do realize, and this is an important th point to make because people talk past one another because some talk about international reconciliation, others about interpersonal. So I'm, I'm glad that you, that you drew attention to this, to this problem. Um, I still believe that the questions of, of forgiveness um, to start the, with the third of your questions or points, um, forgiveness is still a concept. And again, I talk in this instance primarily about interpersonal reconciliation, the cases I mentioned, and maybe national, not so much international. But I think forgiveness is still an, an instance we can talk about internationally as well. And um, I'm not quite sure why we necessarily should say that uh, the U.S. Are reconciled uh, and Vietnam are reconciled. I mean, what is the demand for a characterization of reconciliation? I mean, why is that necessary? Um, you know, we can call it like coexistence or whatever else. Um, or we can see that there is uh, some kind of friendly relationship going on. But wh what's the need to call it reconciliation other than to make us feel good? Um, so again, mine is a maximalist understanding of reconciliation. It's not just applied to any and every occurrence. It happens to come about. And if you look historically at issues, um, a 50-year absence of violent conflict is not necessarily an instance of reconciliation. I mean, if you just look a little bit longer, you know, countries like France and Germany, for example, remained enemies for quite a while. Just because there wasn't any, um, any war uh, does not mean there was reconciliation achieved. And this also doesn't preclude from having business or any other relations. So I actually would question the empirical case per se, but I'll leave that aside. But I think we can still demand, we should demand um, that forgiveness be part of it. Take the example of Poland and Germany, for instance. We talked about this earlier in passing. Um, Willy Brandt, of course, went to Poland in 1972 and he knelt down uh, and, and uh, basically, by so doing, took a step towards atoning for Germany's sins, if you will. We can debate whether or not this was sufficient an apology. Um, uh, I would say probably it wasn't sufficient. And yet, um, why would it not be possible to demand, for instance, in order for full-scale conciliation between Germany and, and Poland to obtain, that the, that the Polish state, say, qua government, um, accepts uh, or sort of forgives Germany uh, as a state for these kinds of sins committed in 1939 and thereafter. I'm not quite sure why it couldn't apply, why we couldn't make it work. Uh, as opposed to uh, talking about the, the measurement question, um, you're absolutely right to, to point out that this is very difficult to measure. But when I talk about measurement, and I think this is the way we have come to think about things, as soon as you hear measurement, you think data, quantitative, large N. 
I think about uh, measurement also in a qualitative sense, and this is like the last remarks I made in passing go to this, that ultimately you need uh, interpretive studies, you need sort of anthropological approaches to these issues in particular to get a sense as to whether or not there's movement towards reconciliation, towards forgiveness. You essentially have to break down local understandings, if they even exist, of forgiveness or mercy. There may be other terms, like if you're in a Buddhist situation, for example, it may not be about forgiveness or mercy, or it may well be, but somewhat differently. Um, this will be very, very difficult to study, but I think um, we owe it to the subject matter that we, that we take this effort. Um, I think it would be um, dangerous to, um, to conclude that a certain... Uh, whether it's forgiveness or reconciliation, obtains um, to sort of take a shortcut to such a conclusion. Um, so I don't have any direct answers. I have a couple of indicators that do exist on this. And lastly, the first point you made was that um, I still believe that, that it, it is not mutually exclusive or contradictory to have forgiveness being a one-sided uh, concept and reconciliation a two-sided concept. I just believe that with reconciliation... Um, the principal emphasis um, is really on the injured party, essentially. And I think uh, the injured party, and some people have criticized me for suggesting, well, you don't require anything from the offender. Um, and well, I, I require social interaction, but I do require more from the injured party because the injured party ultimately um, has to do... Um, has probably a harder time doing the living, and that's why I require forgiveness on that party's part and then mercy in addition to forgiveness. Um, I'm not quite sure that answers your, your challenge. Uh, I doubt it does, um, but, but uh, that's, that's what I have to say for now. But I get the last word, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, okay, so just on two of the points, you know, with respect to Vietnam and the United States, <clears throat> I wouldn't say that they're reconciled because they're coexisting. The point is that they've resumed diplomatic relations, they are cooperating economically. There's a whole set of new relations that are, have taken place, mm. um, but not necessarily forgiveness. So that's a good counterexample, I think, to your theory. Um, with respect to um, why can't nations forgive, I think the ultimate answer is because they're not persons. And forgiveness has something to do on most accounts um, with a change of self, with ad uh, adopting a new attitude, with uh, forswearing or moderating resentment. and. Those are not easily attributed to abstract entities like nations. Mm. So if you want to make your case go, you have to overcome that objection. Yeah. yeah. Let me try. Okay. Um, I think you are right that we do not treat states as persons, and yet we do at the same time also. And I think just because we haven't yet thought about something in a particular way doesn't mean we shouldn't in the future. Take, for instance, the case of states as international actors. States are treated as, as unitary actors in international law. States are coded properties of persons, essentially. Especially when we talk about, for example, the arrest warrant issued for President Bashir in Sudan, right? Um, this is basically about the responsibility of states, qua heads of states, for international crime. So if we assume that this principle exists in international law, I don't see why we cannot go further and treat states as, as sort of akin to persons in another realm. Sure, I think yeah, it does yeah. require philosophical reasoning, it requires some, some amendments, but I think it's not impossible. I'm not suggesting it's, it's the easiest thing to do, but I think it can be done. I think it is not more or less artificial than attributing a responsibility or any other uh, motives to state, as we have done for centuries, uh, incidentally, in international law. They're, they're akin, but the, the, the big important disanalogy here is that this has to do with the link to the emotions or the sentiments. So if forgiveness has to do with forswearing resentment and with a change of self, it's that which doesn't get adopted very easily in the case of a corporate identity or state identity. Mm -hmm. There's issues of responsibility, attribution, all that. Mm -hmm. But that's, I think that's the problem. That's, that doesn't transfer. Mm -hmm. I think, but I think it can be made to transfer. And the same, it was another good example. We, we do treat um, corporations as entities that can be, that are blameworthy as entities, not by virtue of the, the persons being a part of it. So again, it's a challenge. Certainly it's a conceptual challenge, but I think it can be met. And with the case of Vietnam, again, I, I'm just not quite sure that this is really um, reconciliation um, at all. I think there's more to be required. And you mentioned the example of diplomatic relations. Well, we have diplomatic relations, or we had them, or you had, with the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War as well. And it's clearly it was not a case of, of international reconciliation. So I'm not quite sure that that's a sufficient indicator to speak of reconciliation um, at the international level. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much to Jens for sharing his systematic concept of reconciliation, giving us uh, much to think about.